Hello and welcome to the open platform of Public TV of Armenia. Today I am honored to host Mr. Zare Sinanyan, High Commissioner of Armenia for Diaspora Affairs, and we will discuss the post-war situation in Armenian diaspora. Mr. Sinanyan, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Please describe the current situation in diaspora. What do we have now after the post-war? In the diaspora, we're uh, experiencing much of the same uh, sentiments that the population of Armenia is experiencing, which is uh, a degree of shock, a degree of disillusionment, a uh, degree of despair, sadness for the losses that we've suffered and uh, the military defeat that we have um, uh, experienced in this war. Uh, and in some communities, uh, folks are much faster uh, in getting out of this uh, shock and getting back to the work that they've done vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Armenian diaspora relations uh, than compared to other communities. We have uh, also professional groups that, are, uh, that never missed a beat. They never really stopped to uh, mourn they, because they realized that uh, work must go on. Uh, Armenia is still here. Armenia has enormous needs and needs of the diaspora more so than ever before. So we have uh, educational groups, uh, we have medical professionals, we have many, many non-governmental uh, benevolent organizations throughout the world that are engaged in, in uh, assisting Armenia now with its needs. And the needs are numerous because on top of uh, everything that we knew about and we had before this war, now we have uh, displaced uh, thousands, or tens of thousands of displaced people from Artsakh and the liberated territories. We have um, also families of fallen and wounded soldiers that may mm -hmm. need assistance and need, need assistance. So I'm very grateful that we have those organizations and uh, those organizations are not limited to the Western diaspora, the Eastern diaspora, they're, they're from all over the world and they continue their benevolent work. They're, they will have offices in Yerevan, they'll have warehouses and they're very active and they're uh, filling an important gap that exists there. So uh, what trends do we have in the Armenian diaspora? What, what can you tell about the yeah, trends? Uh, in the trends in diaspora are uh, as follows. If I can sort of simplify it, I know it's over, I'm oversimplifying it, but to sort of uh, put, put them into categories, you have these professional groups uh, and you have these aid groups that are very active. They're at it. They're, they're working with us day and night. We're working with them, with their local offices, with their uh, offices uh, overseas to make their work as productive as possible, to be as, of as much assistance as possible. Uh, by the way, in terms of the assistance to the, to the displaced people and also uh, those individuals who are in Artsakh, who returned to Artsakh and are rebuilding their lives, uh, I will be traveling to Stepanakert with our minister for, uh, 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 for um, emergency situations, uh, probably second week of January, just to see everything on the ground, although he's visited already and uh, we're hoping that the health minister will also join us. He's visited many times, including several times during the war. But we will be there to assess the damage, assess the, the needs uh, and come back and also convey all of that to diaspora, to those organizations that are already in this field and those that aren't but would like to be helpful. You have the other category uh, in the diaspora that's just still shocked and, and still trying to recover psychologically from uh, the war and it's understandable just like many many people in Armenia they're still mourning uh, and I'm sure time will somewhat heal or, or the wounds or, or ease the pain because again we have much important work that that cannot remain unattended and then you have another much much smaller segment that is um, politicized politicized and that very small segment is uh, also connected to the old regime, all of them. Uh, and they have the same type of sort of militant political demands, unrealistic and also irresponsible, that um, they have, uh, their counterparts have here. But I have to say that the further you are from Armenia, the easier it is to give in to panic. Because since you're not here on the ground and all you have is your own media sources that's constantly spewing disinformation and you have media sources that are 90 percent controlled by the old regime and they're spewing poison if you read if you place yourself in facebook or in the online media 
you will be under the impression that Armenia is experiencing an Armageddon and that it's come to an end, it's a catastrophe, that there are mass manifestations and, and rallies all throughout the streets. Uh -huh. In Not reality, there's, there's the always country, yeah. 300 to 2,000 people somewhere, either at Opera Square or the <clears throat> Republican Square, and that's it. That's it. Now, there are many people that have many questions, in, including myself, that want those questions answered. We must answer those questions. We must do a full analysis of what went wrong and how to prevent that in the future. One thing we know for sure is that Armenia had simply fallen behind about 10 to 15 years militarily. And this is not my assessment. It's the assessment of military experts throughout the world. 10 to 15 years behind in terms of its military's structure, its military's armament, its military's motivation. And all of that happened in the last 26 years, mostly in the last 26 years. So that we know for sure. Um, we look forward to working with all of our friends in the diaspora, all the patriots, it doesn't matter. They could be in this third group that I described, it doesn't matter. If they're two patriots, they will come out of this loop and they will understand that either they stand with the people of Armenia or they don't. And it's their choice. They make that choice today. So these are the sentiments in the diaspora. Again, I'm, I know for, for a fact that time will heal some of these wounds. We need to look forward. We need to plan for the next uh, event. You know, I don't know what that event is going to be, but I'm talking about mm -hmm. event in negative terms. We have to be ready. We can't be caught uh, un, you know, unprepared like we did this time. And time is something that's very scarce for us. So for, for us to waste time on, on nonsense uh, and to try to imitate uh, huge public sentiment for resignation and so on and so forth, just counterproductive. Um, you talked about the sentiments or trends that are, um, they have negative uh, uh, impact on the diaspora. How far can we say that the, either traditional uh, organizations or unions or some powers mm -hmm. uh, represent the whole diaspora itself? Um, my experience, and uh, both living in the United States for 32 years and doing this for the last year and a half, is that the overwhelming majority, the overwhelming majority, not, you can't even compare the two groups, has no affiliation with the organized diaspora. They have no affiliation with any political groups. They have no uh, affiliation with any organizations. They're just Armenians who live there. And this is, I'm not saying this is a good thing because you, you want the diaspora to be organized. You want them to be affiliated with something, some organization. It, it doesn't have to be political. It doesn't have to be religious. It doesn't have to be... A professional, but some organization because being organized obviously yields yeah it yields better results. But right now, in terms of do the does the old diaspora or the organized mm -hmm. diaspora rather speak for the diaspora? Absolutely not. Not even close. Not, it never did. It, it's certainly not since 1990 when the balance of uh, the demography in the diaspora shifted. It went from the old diaspora to a mix of old and new diaspora. And already a great part of the old diaspora didn't have any allegiance to any organization. But with the influx of post-Soviet uh, migrants, immigrants, you have complete disbalance of people who are unaffiliated and people who are. Again, I, I hope that the unaffiliated some, at some point do become affiliated with some type of an organization. Uh, it can be a, you know, a, a benevolent organization, an organization that does good either there or here. But being organized certainly is a good thing. Uh, and also, as you mentioned, uh, as we can see also the uh, tapes here uh, showing that many, many protests and many, many supporting uh, actions in diaspora were organized not even by traditional organizations or unions. They were just uh, self-organized. Uh, Certainly, you saw, you saw this both in Europe and you saw this in the United States. Uh, in, in Russia, uh, things are much more complicated because there's, there is an organization, but 99.9% .9 of Armenians don't affiliate with that organization. But also uh, concerning the internal problems, possible internal problems in Russia uh, with uh, other Of course, minorities. of course. So the demonstrations didn't happen in Russia. We didn't encourage people to have demonstrations. We, the Russian community did an, an enormous amount of work to support the Armenian war effort. But not much of it, yeah, much of it went unseen mm -hmm. to the public eye. 
uh, it wasn't unseen to my eye because I was coordinating that work from Yerevan and it, they did an enormous job. Each community did, uh, did, did a part, I want to say did their part or, or did the most, utmost. I mean, some did more than others, others, you know, it, it's hard to compare who did more and who did less. That's not the point. But the point is that, yes, so for example, in Europe, we saw the emergence of these unaffiliated Armenians who undertook a lot of the organization of the demonstrations and also the blocking of the highways, Street, the highways, highways between, yeah. between uh, the nations. nations, yeah. And those were done by individuals that are absolutely unaffiliated with any existing organization. And same, same can be told about mm -hmm. uh, the efforts in the uh, in, uh, United States and, and other places too. Um, Mr. Sinanyan, what directions must be the priority for your office and what directions are you working on now? Our priorities uh, remain the same before and after the war. Uh, we may change you know, some tactics, but strategically they remain the same. That is a, a deeper integration between Armenia and diaspora. I'll tell you that integration uh, is, has been non-existent uh, up until you know, very recently mm -hmm. uh, because that integration has always been based on only two things. One is monetary transfers and second, aid, some type of aid. Uh, even the monetary transfers are a type of individual aid, you know, family mm -hmm. to family aid, but monetary transfers and uh, hu humanitarian work through Armenia Fund and other organizations, that has been basically the only level of integration between diaspora and Armenia. Our idea was that we need to integrate substantively. Folks need to be able to hold offices in Armenia, political offices. Folks uh, should be able to open businesses and anticipate profits. Uh, meaning, it shouldn't constantly be non-profit work, shouldn't constantly be benevolent work. It should be profitable work because that's the only way, that's the only sustainable way to grow your economy and the only sustainable way to have homegrown benevolent work. So the integration remains a major goal for us. You know, our EGORTS program is one component mm -hmm. of it. Uh, we've been talking very actively and very loudly about the need to reform the constitution. And, uh, and, and whatever laws there are that are creating impediments to diaspora engagement in, on the, in the uh, governance field. So I don't want to say political field because you can be a, uh, appointed a minister and not be affiliated with any political party or movement. Absolutely. And, and that's what I think we should be moving towards, a more technocratic kind of a uh, system where professionals hold professional offices. The politicians, sort of the, the party ideologists, always will have a place. They'll have their place, but we, Armenia needs, badly needs, technocrats to hold offices, good managers, do or good organizers, who can uh, streamline uh, the, the ministries and departments that they control, who can teach folks how to work properly. I mean, it should be all, all about problem solving. One concept that's virtually non-existent in Armenia. Problem solving, non-existent. People don't understand what that is. Um, so we, these changes, cultural changes have to take place. That's, that's sort of the integration part that I'm talking about. Second important part, of course, is uh, migration, so, so uh, repatriation. Armenia badly, badly needs human resources. And we're talking about like just human resources. I'm not even talking about professionals, highly trained professionals, because this war once again showed that we are in a you know, people aren't yet talking about this, but a demographic crisis. We are. We can't sustain our numbers in this territory surrounded by the people that we're surrounded at. It's almost like we can't justify having this homeland if we don't have enough people living on it. Because if in our neighboring country the population keeps growing and they're now at 9 million, and we have gone from 3.7 million in 1991 to 2.5 to or 2.8 million, why? I mean, why are we doing this? This is our homeland. Should it's be going to be a real catastrophe. Real catastrophe. So we're, we're headed for a catastrophe that's going to basically lead to the elimination of the Armenian Republic and the Armenian people. Unless we completely shift the dem demographic uh, uh, tendencies. And that can be done through two means. We know that one is local demographic natural growth, which is hard to uh, secure unless you have certain economic political and sociological uh, changes. For example, there are few non-Muslim countries that have huge population growth. I and mean, put, put China aside for a second. Um, but Israel does. 
Israel has a, a natural growth that's something like 3.1 or 3.2, mm. which is a great number. We are at 1.8. I mean, we, we have problems. So we need to shift num that number up, certainly above 2.1, but hopefully closer to 3.2. But that can't happen if we don't have a healthy economy, if we don't have a great economic uh, education system. A key issue in Armenia is the education system. The education reforms should have happened a long time ago. They still haven't hap happened. I know there's a law circulating on the higher education reform. I think it should be uh, reviewed once again because I'm not sure if it's sufficient. Uh, I'm hearing uh, there's many components of it that are insufficient. And one may ask, well, why are you talking about education reform? We're talking about dem demography here. I'll tell you because folks in Armenia, uh, and in, as in diaspora, Armenians are obsessed with their children. Uh, yeah. as, as are most people, but Armenia is more so than right. Armenia is yeah. more so than than others. They will education will become a key p component. It still is for whether people decide to move away from Armenia or actually come, come to Armenia. Yeah. If the education system is a stellar system, they know that their kids are going to receive a quality, relatively cheap, good education in Armenia. And quite the opposite. If it's a bad, bad uh, educa educational system, people will keep leaving because they, they understand that in the 21st century, education is everything. So if they can move out and give their kids a better opportunity in life, they will do so. And those people that otherwise were thinking of moving to Armenia, they will make the decision based on their educa kids' education. And employment actually comes as number two to education. After the education. After education, yeah, number two to education. So this is a key, key component of uh, rectifying our demographic situation. And the third, of course, is uh, investments, economic investments in Armenia. Uh, we need to grow. Our economy needs to grow because in order for us to have that good education, be able to finance it, in order for us to have a great military, finance. we need to be able to finance it. All yeah. those monies will have to come from taxes. And taxes are levied on, on businesses as well as individuals. But individuals and businesses have to make money in order for, for, for them to be taxed. So economic growth and diaspora can play a great role in being um, a, a catalyst in economic growth through their investments. Now, we've had some serious problems in the last, I don't want to talk about pre-revolutionary years because that, that was an utter catastrophe. It was corrupt and it was incompetent. But since the revolution, we've had serious problems trying to get tho those investments that were coming to Armenia to a point of um, where they can start operating. Mm -hmm. So all the bureaucratic nonsense, all the paperwork and all that, we, we've had a very bad record so far in securing those things and we need to rectify that situation. A diaspora needs to know that when they come and they're asking they have to, to be open sure a, that they Yeah, of course, it's a, it's a normal investment. Come, yeah. it's a, there's nothing unreasonable about it that they're not going to be pushed around, they're not going to be given the runaround from one office to the next office to the next office, because this you know what, business people don't need to is, deal with yeah. that. They'll go somewhere where that doesn't exist, and somewhere that's more profitable than Armenia. Many people come to Armenia realizing that the profit margin may be smaller, but then they don't want to they, they deal with nonsense. They don't want to be pushed around and have to run from one office to the other. And again, this is a result of the old system. The bureaucrats, love to pe push people around. They love to give them trouble. And we need to eliminate this. Anyone who creates any impediment for any investment in Armenia, a legitimate, good, legal investment, should not be associated with the state. They should, they should be fired. They should be gone immediately. OK, then uh, what are the main expectations in diaspora? And what programs do you have for 2021? Uh, all the uh, strategic directions that I talked about, obviously we have program, programs for all of those, and I'm proud that in the nine months that we've had, nine months of normal functioning, and even then it wasn't normal functioning because remember in the first, when we started, we started an office, not a ministry, which mm -hmm. means that we were actually had to transfer a ministry into uh, an office within the prime minister's office, which was a messy tr uh, transformation. Yeah, it was an organizational yeah. transformation which was very difficult, and it's really not complete yet. But despite all that, despite all that, despite the fact that we have uh, maybe 35% of the employees that I inherited. By the way, this, is, this goes to the issue of a lot of the opposition, so-called opposition, but in reality, old regime media, keeps talking about 
how much money we're spending and about bonuses and nonsense like that. I have streamlined our office. I've cut down about 70% of the workforce and we're still doing 10 times more work than mm -hmm. they were. So uh, anyone who talks about effective and competency, I mean, shame on them. They're either clueless or they're completely ideological and they're just out to hurt us. Do you think they us. are just manipulating the information? Of, of course they're manipulating it. And it's so transparent. I mean, they're, and they're, they have no idea what they're talking about. So um, we've, we've been able to implement several new programs. Some of them are in, in effect already. Others are in progress. And uh, IGORTS, obviously, is a program that we, we were in love with. We still are. And despite the war and despite COVID, we're implementing the program. Uh, unfortunately, instead of 100 fellows, we have 50 fellows now who are integrated in all the governmental ministries and, and uh, either uh, in other departments. And um, also the only non-governmental entity that they're working for is, um, is the Office of the Human Rights Defender, the Ombudsman. Uh, also, we have uh, a fellow in the National Assembly by the way, working for an opposition deputy. Mm -hmm. So we don't differentiate. We don't differentiate any, uh, any deputy that could have the asked for a fellow. To bring, uh, of course, to of course, and the, have give them the opportunity to work in that environment and make things better and improve yeah. the situation. Igor is ongoing. It's going very well. It's only about two, two and a half months in progress and two and a, two and a half months of hell because remember, 44 days of those two and a half mm -hmm. months were the war where our folks were mobilized around the war effort, both in our office and the other ministries. One of our fellows actually... Running all around, maybe. Yeah, one of our fellows actually times. went and volunteered at the oh. front. So, um, uh, one, at least one of our fellows came during the war. He said, no, I know, I'm coming. I'm, not gonna, I'm coming because there's a war. So, we have very patriotic fellows that are very engaged and very happy. Most of them... At this point, it looks like, if not most of them, but a lot of them intend to stay, migrate to Armenia and stay forever. And we intend to continue this program next year. We have the mapping of the diaspora program, which is a strategic program and is going to be a, you know, it's a, it's a national program that I hope will help our state in perpetuity uh, forever. Obviously, we need, we'll be uh, updating that program annually to keep the information fresh, but that program is in progress and will be constant, it will, will be completed by the first quarter of the next year. Another program that we're working on, which to some may, may seem strange, but we're going to push forward with it, is the Integration mm -hmm. Center. You know, right now the opposition media is trying to create such a hellish image around Armenia, both in Armenia and outside. Uh, outside, obviously, they're trying to discredit Armenia and the Armenian government. That's understandable. Uh, inside Armenia, they're trying to demoralize its population. They're trying to, A, get people to come out and demonstrate and demand the resignation of the government, which is not happening, isn't happening. Uh, and B, they're trying to break our people and have them all migrate outside of Armenia. That's what they're trying to accomplish. So in this atmosphere, again, we talked about the demographic troubles. Our goal is to bring folks in because we need our fellow brothers and sisters more so than ever. We need to bring people in. And our office is designed after the, the Israeli office you know, of the uh, integration. And it's going to facilitate people's experience of moving to Armenia and settling here. There are many layers, most probably, in this integration office and the integration process. And uh, uh, one of our talks, you mentioned about Israel, which has the most efficient, maybe, integration and re-migration process. Um, what changes do you see that are needed and reviews are needed with, with the, in the work with diaspora? Also concerning the upcoming constitutional amendments and also, as some of our, our deputies mentioned, uh, the need to bring diaspora Armenians and integrate them into the state governmental system. Right. So uh, I've been talking about the need to remove all the legal and constitutional impediments to engaging diaspora and professionals in the Armenian government because those impediments exist and they were created in the last 20 years. And, um, you know, I was glad to hear that one of the opposition deputies has basically joined this campaign, which is, which is great. We welcome his, his joining it. But we have to do it again. We, we don't have the luxury of locking out 
seven million people when we're having trouble here. We're having problems finding the right competent individuals to head some of the departments. Again, if the best people are not in Armenia, they're outside, we need to go find them, convince them and get away, you know, find a way to bring them here. Because our state and our nation is at stake. The future of our people is at stake. We need to go find the best and monetize it or you know, somehow incentivize them to come and uh, put things in order, uh, organize better, work better. You know, a lot of the criticism that we're hearing from the opposition is that you know, the uh, people uh, are, aren't incompetent, they're not doing a good job and so on and so forth. Okay, but again, we, we are, you know, I, I'm, I'm having continuous conversations with the, with the Republic's leader, leadership about this and they're very open-minded. So now we have to remove those impediments, very, remove those impediments so that we can actually do this legally because if the Constitution doesn't allow an ex-person who's the best expert in this one field to be appointed minister because he has to not only become an Armenian citizen, but he has to live here for four or five years. Well, that obviously can't happen immediately, right? This Overnight. is one of the most obvious. It's one of the most obvious ones. Another one is people can't run for office, so you can't become a parliament deputy if mm -hmm. you haven't lived here for a long time. I think it's a silly rule. Again, if you have an influx of, let's say, 10,000 Lebanese Armenians over a year, and next year they're holding elections, and those people are a critical mass, and they won't. They like a candidate. They sure. won't elect that person as candidate. They, Why they, shouldn't they, they be able to? The national of course, if, if they've moved to Armenia with their family, they're, they've become citizens. They should be allowed to run for office. It's a different matter that if they're here, but it's questionable whether they're here or not. Their family's not here. I mean, that's a different matter. But people who move here with their families and are established here should be able to run for office. Remember, it's a democratic system. If he's not competent, people won't elect them. I mean. The days of passing out bribes are left. That's before 2018. That's the old regime who used to steal elections. We're not doing that. We're not, that's not going to happen in the future. So folks that want to run for office and can actually get people to vote for them deserve to run for office. And also uh, create some factions in the parliament, maybe, <coughs> with uh, bringing opposition also parliamentaries. Of course. Of course. Uh, the opposition situation in Armenia is very, very dire. Armenia's problem isn't the government, really. I think, you know, I, sometimes I put myself outside of my position and I, and I look at Armenia and I think the problem is the opposition. And I'm not, I don't mean this opposition. I mean, this oppos there's no opposition. There's, you have to have a strong, powerful, legitimate opposition that actually enjoys the support of the government. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the support of the people. The support of the people. You know, it has to be a popular Mm -hmm. uh, opposition that can compete with the ruling government uh, uh, party. That right now doesn't exist, which is unfortunate because having a strong opposition also keeps the government in check, makes them work better, makes them more efficient. Uh, so I hope we get to that point where we can have a legitimate uh, opposition that has the support of a segment of the population, doesn't have to pass out bribes, isn't associated with the old criminal no. regime. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a dream. I mean, it has to happen. Hopefully, the sooner it happens, the better it is for Armenia. Uh, do you uh, want to see an opposition like uh, media as a watchdog for the government? Uh, of course. I mean, the opposition, again, it's, it, it, you, you, if you have an opposition political movement, it has to strive for power. It has to want to become the governing force because otherwise, why are they there? Just to criticize? No, they have to want to become government. Well. They want to become government. All that's doing is forcing the existing government to work better. Well, you don't have that in Armenia right now. You have the government, and then you have an old, utterly discredited group of people that have all become millionaires, have robbed this country blind, have robbed the Armenian military of its ability to defend the country, and now we're seeing the results. We need a legitimate new opposition composed of legitimate people that are not tarnished and tainted by the old regime. And it... it it's as necessary for Armenia as it is for the government. And what about the diaspora? Is it necessary for diaspora, do you think? Of course it is. Yeah. I hope that the diaspora, as I've been saying before I even moved to Armenia, I would, every time I would visit Armenia, I would go back and I would tell my fellow diasporans, I would say that you have to be more outspoken. You have to have more demands. And those demands have to be uh, for the benefit of Armenia. I mean, you know, if 
If you think that this uh, constitutional provision that bans uh, diaspora Armenians from holding high office is a problem, you need to voice it. Voice it. It's a legitimate concern, and you need to apply pressure in order for that to happen. Unfortunately, the traditional diaspora used to believe, and I think they still do, that somehow challenging the government means challenging Armenia. No, government and Armenia are two different things. Uh, challenging the government or forcing it to do something, uh, if it's constructive and it's done the right way, is a positive thing. Again, the diaspora isn't just there to contribute financial aid to Armenia. I mean, it, it should also look at Armenia as something that they own and that they're willing to sacrifice for. And if you view a country that way, I think you'll also be more willing to be more forceful in your demands. Again, unfortunately, right, you know, the same people that for 26 years didn't say a word about the corruption and the terrible things that were happening in Armenia, the murders, the looting of the country, the theft, didn't say a word, are now demanding the government to resign. Obviously, it's hard to really listen to those people, especially since they were part of the government in the past. Mr. Sinanian, thank you very much for your time and for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Today I was talking to Mr. Sinanian, who is High, Commission, High Commissioner of Armenia for Diaspora Affairs, and we discussed the post-war situation in Armenian diaspora. This is Open Platform of Armenian Public Television. Thank you for watching us. Thank you.